Hope all of you are having a good weekend, and for those of you that are religious, hope you're having a good Easter weekend. I came across this article concerning what kind of government we, the good people of the United States, have. It was uh, done by Princeton, and you can find it up at policymike.com. And I'll make it a little bit easier for you to read. You can uh, just go into the description section. I got a link for you. Princeton concludes what kind of government America really has. And it's not a democracy. Well, before we continue, first off, the United States of America is not supposed to be a democracy. It's supposed to be a republic. But I digress. I'm not going to read the entire article, but I will read uh, bits and pieces. And then we'll discuss it. A new scientific study from Princeton researchers Martin Gillens and Benjamin I. Page have finally put some science behind the recent popular argument that the United States isn't a democracy or republic anymore. I had to insert that part because, yes, we're a republic. Well, we used to be anyways. And they found that, in fact, America is basically what do you think it is? What is America actually? That's correct. An oligarchy. And what is an oligarchy, you ask? Well, I'm happy to tell you. An oligarchy is a system where power is effectively wielded by a small number of individuals defined by their status called oligarchs. Members of the oligarchy are rich, the well-connected, and the politically powerful, as well as particular well-placed individuals and in institutions like banking, financing, or the military. For their study, Gillians and Page compiled data from roughly 1,800 different policy initiatives in the years between 1981 and 2002. They then compared these policy changes with the expressed opinion of the United States public, comparing the preferences of the average American at the 50th percentile of income to what those Americans at the 90th percentile preferred, as well as the opinions of major lobbying or business groups. The researchers found out that the government followed the directive set forth by the latter too much more often. It's beyond alarming, as Gillians and Page write, quote-unquote, preferences of the average American appear to have not only become minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. In other words, their statistics say, your opinion and my opinion literally does not matter to those who run our government. And this is the part where they kind of skew a little bit, and I disagree with their point of view on this issue, but I'll read it anyways. They say in this article, quote-unquote, that may explain why mandatory background checks on gun sales supported by 83 or 91% of the Americans aren't in place, or why Congress has taken no action on greenhouse gas emissions, even when such legislation is supported by the vast majority of citizens. And I know they have links to... Um, other uh, to the Gallup poll and other things as well, but I don't think the majority of them. Well, I mean, I mean, stop for a second. Okay, so I think the majority of the American people are pro-gun. They do believe in people's rights to bear arms, but I can see where a good portion of the population believes in mandatory background checks. So I mean, I can kind of see the the issue there. But regarding greenhouse emissions, I don't know. I mean, I guess there's obviously a, a good percentage of the population that believes in that, but that's beside the point, okay? That's not the issue here. They just wanted to put that in there to skew their point of view. The point here that we have to all focus on is the fact that we no longer live in a republic, not a democracy. And the study that they did from Princeton basically proves that. Okay, so there's some graphs and there's some more information if you want to go read it for yourself. And, well, I'll add some other uh, paragraphs, too. All right, so what kind of oligarchy do we have? As Gawker's Hamilton Nolan explains, Gillian's and Page's findings provide support for two theories of governance, economic elite domination and biased pluralism. The first is pretty straightforward in the states that ultra-wealthy wield all the power in a given system, though some argue that this system still allows elites and corporations and the government to become powerful as well. Here, power does not necessarily derive from wealth, but those in power almost invariably come from the upper class. Bias pluralism, on the other hand, argues that the entire system is a mess and interest groups ruled by elites are fighting for dominance of a political process. Also, because of their vast wealth of resources, interest groups of large business tend to dominate a lot of the discourse. 
In either case, the result is the same. Big corporations, the ultra-wealthy, ultra special interests with lots of money and power essentially make all of the decisions. Citizens will too little to no power politically. In America, the findings indicate that tends to towards either of these much more than anything close to what we call a democracy. Once again, they put democracy in this. And we're, I don't know why I have to keep repeating myself, but you know what I'm talking about. We are not a democracy. A democracy, you know, simply put, is basically two wolves and one sheep voting on what's for dinner. What we have is a lot more complicated than a democracy. Yes, we, we vote on things as citizens, supposedly, but it works a little bit different than a straight-up pure democracy. Now, the syst democracy systems, such as majoritarian electoral democracy or majoritarian pluralism, under which the policy choices pursued by the government would reflect the opinions of the governed. Obviously, we don't have that. We don't have that in the slightest. The will of the people is no longer being followed by our elected officials. Because, as I've pointed out time and time again, well, since I started doing uploads and videos and podcasts, and even a couple radio shows that you can find on this channel. Our elected officials, doesn't matter what their uh, letter is by their name, Republican, Democrat, whatever, most of them are bought and paid for. They're corrupt. They're a bunch of sociopaths that only care about themselves and serving their true masters, which is not we the people, even though it's supposed to be, even though they're supposed to answer to us. You know, our, our taxes do pay their salaries, our votes are supposed to decide whether or not they get to serve another two or four or six years in office, depending on what they are, a congressman, congresswoman, senator, president, etc. But unfortunately, the majority of the incumbents always get reelected, even if they completely suck ass, and it happens over and over again. And this study basically proves the fact that we do not have a republic or a democracy, as some people call it. We don't even have a democracy. It would be nice if we had a, at least a democracy. At least our, our, our votes would count, even if it's, you know, 51 to 49 percent. But the idea of a republic is to protect the minority vote, those that vote in the minority. So it's a checks and balances system that we're supposed to have, but we don't even have that anymore. The point is, we have an oligarchy in control very rich, very powerful people, and you look at the different families within this government, okay? You have, you know, one faction, the Clintons, Clintons slash Obamas slash Gores, the other faction, the Bushes, and why is it that these people keep getting reelected to office? I mean, like, uh, Papa Bush, you know, he was a CIA director, and then, of course, he was vice president for Reagan, then he got to be president. Then his, you know, what I call his adopted son, even though he's not really an adopted son, he might as well be. You know, Bill Clinton becomes president. Seems a little like, you know, that was a setup right there. Just a transition from Reagan to Clinton with uh, Papa Bush. And then, of course, you know, W, you know, George, you know, Papa Bush's son becomes president. Imagine that. And then, of course, you know, Hillary's run for president in 2008. Yeah, and, uh, well, I mean, chances are she's probably going to run in 2016, and there's also talk of Jeb Bush, another freaking Bush running. So, yeah, I, I, I kind of see the fact that we have an oligarchy. We have these very rich, very powerful people in our government who keep getting reelected. I mean, there's so many of them on both sides of the aisle, and they're all rich, they're all well-connected, influential, and behind them, of course, you have all these big entities, the vast corporations, big energy, the banking system, the military industrial complex, the prison industrial complex, big pharma, and the list goes on and on. You and I no longer matter anymore to these people. We just, those of us that still pay taxes, we have our uses. You know, as, as long as they continue to suck us dry, what little is left in this country. But at the end of the day, their goal is to make everybody, you know, to some form or fashion, dependent on this nanny slash police state. And unfortunately, I, I really don't see it getting any better because people are going to continue to reelect these bastards, whether they're Republican or Democrat. 
they're not going to get anybody in there that actually truly cares. I mean, there's a few. I'm not going to say everybody in D.C. are a bunch of snakes, and I know that's insulting to call them snakes to real snakes. But the point is there are a few good ones left, but they're in such a small minority that, unfortunately, they, they stand up and, and they speak on behalf of the people from both sides of the aisle once again. There's good Democrats and good Republicans. But that's the issue. It's a divisive tactic, and they've been using it for years, this whole you know, white hat, black hat mentality, kind of like in wrestling. You know, one day this wrestler's the good guy. Then the next day he becomes the heel. And then eventually they switch the roles back. That's what's been happening for too long now. You know, during one election cycle, the Democrats are the quote unquote bad guy. Then the Republicans ride in as the good guy and they get majority control. And then they become the bad guy. And then, of course, it's a switcheroo. Then the Democrats come back in as the supposed good guy once more. The, the reality is, as long as this. You know, a little smoke and mirrors and this what I call the two-party puppet show continues and we don't get past this, you know, divisive nature of blaming each other and demonizing one another because we're all different political beliefs. We're never going to solve any of our problems. What we need in office are Republicans and Democrats that are willing to work together doesn't matter if they're liberal, libertarian, constitutional, conservative, moderate, independent, whatever. The point is, they're supposed to go to D.C. to serve we the people. And since this is a big, giant melting pot of different peoples, different backgrounds, different histories, different cultures, different pigments and lifestyles, etc., um, we have different opinions. We are... There's... A lot of differences there, but there are some common interests. There's some middle ground that can be achieved if these different political factions would actually work together. But no, they don't do that because they enjoy the game. They enjoy the, the demonization, the, the, the act, the song and dance, the, the theater that they put on for us because it keeps us divided because we're constantly yelling at each other. You know, Tea Party people and Occupy people and Ron Paul people and rhinos, neocons, liberals, conservatives, libertarians, all these groups are all constantly fighting each other. When we forget one, one thing, we're all Americans. We're all citizens of the United States of America, and we're supposed to work together. We the people. It's not we the conservatives, we the liberals, we the libertarians, we the whites, we the blacks, we the Asians, we the Hispanics, we the people. We are all part of this country, the United States. That's what it's all about. You and me working together. We may have our differences, but so what? There are things that we have in common. If you look at two people, they sit down, they have a conversation. They may have two different backgrounds, one conservative, one liberal, one straight, one gay, one Christian, one atheist. Sit down and have a conversation, and eventually you're going to find common interests. Eventually you're going to find that middle ground, and that's what we need in the local governments, state governments, and that's what we definitely need in our federal government. Men and women willing to work together for the best interests of the people as a whole, or else we're going to continue to have this little back and forth action. And the oligarchs who truly run the country who have taken over because of all this, they're going to get more powerful, more powerful, and more powerful, and wealthier. And we're all going to suffer for it. So while we're yelling and screaming at each other over our differences, name calling, they're laughing at us from behind the curtain. So ask yourselves, who's the bigger idiot? That liberal you made fun of, that conservative you poked fun at, or the oligarchs laughing at all of us right now because we're not willing to stand together, work things out, and come up with real solutions to save this country.